Welcome, it's great to have all of you here today. Thank you for coming to be part of this experience and of encountering God in worship. Special welcome to those of you online. I'm always glad that you take the time to join with us and discover what God is up to in our world and in our lives. And this morning I got to give a shout out to our Southwest Campus crew who are running a full technical rehearsal over there this morning. So hi guys, thanks for working so hard at it. Three weeks, can you really believe it? A two year journey and we're just about three weeks away from what's going to happen. How many of you are going to be there at launch next Sunday? Three Sundays, the 20th. I don't even remember the date. Yeah, some hands. I'd love to invite all, well, not all of you because we're not fit in, but I'd love to invite a lot of you if you'd go over there that morning as part of the celebration, October 20, the 11.15 service time. And in the meantime, we had prayer and fasting guides. Jeff mentioned them last weekend. You can grab those on Main Street as you leave or get a digital copy. We'd love to invite you to pray with us over these next three weeks as God leads us forward into all that he has for us. We still have a number of volunteer opportunities as well. And if you could make a commitment between now and Christmas to serve in the Southwest Campus, it would be a big help to us, and it would be a big help to launching into this brand new community that God is joining with us to do. Because ultimately, that's what we're all about, building lives that honor God, connecting, growing, serving, sharing, and we'd love you to be part of that journey with us. We're asking right now, what does chapter two of your life look like? When you flip the page, what comes next? Finishing your education? Beginning your career, getting a new job, retirement, finding a partner, having children or grandchildren, securing your future financially, maybe a successful surgery. What does chapter two look like for you today? And what about on your faith journey? What would be next? We have a great event coming up next weekend that we call it Next Steps. It's on Sunday evening at 6.30. It's one of those places when you can begin to figure, what would be next for me at FEC? What would God might have for me there? I'd love to meet you, have a conversation with you. We'll have some dessert and coffee. Childcare is available. It's going to be a great opportunity to come together. But what does it look like? Does God have something in store for you? Is it an adventure? Or does it seem terrifying? Is it just to come to church and help out now and again? Or, or did God actually create you for a magnificent purpose? And if he did, do you know what it is? How could you find out? Could your life be so much more than you ever imagined? Welcome to chapter two. My prayer today is that you will discover that, that you will discover exactly what God has in store for you, that your heart would be shaped by his heart and you would begin this adventure with Jesus. We started out this fall series by thinking about walking with the world maker. It's the story of who you are and where you are and how you came to be here. It begins with the story of creation and God's intention in his creation and our identity that is so wrapped up with God's original purposes. He's calling us to fruitful lives. We reminded ourselves of the metaphor of getting over the fence to get to know neighbors and colleagues and friends and spending time with them because not only are we the recipients of God's love and grace, he's calling us to be its agents to take that same love and grace everywhere that we go. And as we participate in God's mission, we realize with him that our world and the people in it, they're beautiful but broken. And God is calling us in his mission to win the hearts of lost and broken people and to see his world made completely brand new. Then we were looking at what it means to depend upon the dream giver, the story of our calling and purpose, the path that's unique to us. How do my dreams, how do your dreams get woven into God's dream for his world? Because God has a plan for you, a dream for you to become a world changer whether you think it or not. And he calls us and gives us vocation. And I know that means taking the long view. It may not all happen tomorrow. It means being patient. It means allowing space and time for God to be at work in our lives, that we would surrender him. It certainly means leaving my limitations behind, thinking I couldn't, when God says you can. Have you heard God's call in your life? Last weekend, Pastor Jeff was talking to us about being changed, changed by the chain breaker. How God leads us out of slavery, leads us out of prison, leads us out of the chains that we find ourselves head captive in. And he frees us and sets us free. We were learning about stepping out in faith, about refusing fear, not allowing fear to freeze us to the spot. We were discovering more about forgiveness and how we as forgiven people can forgive others. And it was an amazing sight to see dozens of people up here, every service at the weekend, discovering new freedom because of Jesus. And so this weekend, we go a step further. The question is, 
How do we hold on to the heart seeker? It's the story of our affections and the things that matter most to us and God's desire to win our hearts and worship because God's mission, it really comes to life in our hearts when we are surrendered, when we are abandoned to God and his love. Could that be you today? You know, in the story of the Bible that we started reading together, Adam and Eve, they're created in God's image. They had a unique purpose. So do we, a purpose to care and to cultivate and to civilize and build community. That's us too. Then we read of the story of Abraham and Sarah and how God gave them a dream, a dream that they would become a blessing to many nations. And that's us too. And then we encountered Moses and God's people being set free from slavery. And that's us too. But while their external slavery in Egypt was over, the journey to inner freedom was only just beginning. You might imagine that would involve getting the playbook from God, some rules perhaps, some instructions about how to live, what holy living could look like so that we could build these lives that honor God. But it's not how the story plays out. The people of Israel have been set free from slavery in Egypt. They've crossed over the sea. They've wandered through the desert. They've arrived at the mountain, Mount Sinai. It must be time for God's law. But you'd be surprised. You see, if you read the book of Exodus where you read of their story, most of it's actually about worship, not about rules. In fact, most of it's about this thing that they called the tabernacle, a tent, a portable worship center that they took with them on their travels with God. It wasn't about rules to try and become better or nicer people. It wasn't about moral perfection evening. It was about God seeking our hearts because worship, not rule keeping, is what God is after most. Now, don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean that God has nothing to say about how we live our lives or about our behavior and choices. All communities need some rules to live by. Driving on the right-hand side of the road is not about moral perfection. It's just about safety and making sure we get here and get home again. The absence of rules is anarchy. Useful rules create a framework. We get that for trade, for security, for peace, for health, for driving in the snow. You could look at all those Old Testament rules. There's a lot of rules about food. Kosher eating. I can imagine Moses. Huge crowd of people. They're leaving Egypt. They're crossing the sea. They're wandering through the Sinai Peninsula on the way to the promised land. They'd quickly run out of all the sandwiches that they brought with them. Now what were they going to do? They were praying to God to give them some food and they're looking around foraging for food. God gave them instructions. Don't eat scorpions. That's a great place to start. It's not going to go well if that's all you can find. And he's got rules like that that make for community life. Don't kill your neighbor. Don't steal his stuff. Don't steal his wife. If people are sick, quarantine them. We get no hand sanitizers and hardly any doctors. Put them off to the side. Let's see what happens if we can help them get healthy again. It makes sense. Just basic regulations to keep everybody healthy and whole in the journey. I know it doesn't explain everything that's in the Bible, but it does remind us of this. Rules are not the guarantee of God's approval. They never are. Rules don't make us morally perfect people. So if rule keeping doesn't shape us, what does shape us? What does? The answer is worship. Worshiping God isn't something we do because God is selfish and he needs us to prop up his ego a little bit every week. Our purpose is not to be sort of mood enhancers for what's going on in heaven so they can all relax at the sound of our voices. So what is the point? Why does it matter so much? Why do we do it? Why was this portable worship center, the tabernacle, always in the center of their camp as they made their journey? It's because they're free. We're free. But we need to learn how to live free. Worship is going to help them know who they are and whose they are. It will embody their hopes and it will embody their dreams. Worship is embodied hope. They didn't own the promised land yet. They weren't there, but they had the tent. They knew where they were going. It's embodied hope. And for us as we worship, it's how we express our longing for God. It's how we express our complete dependence upon God. It's how we express our hope that God is changing our lives, my life. It's how we express our hope that God is changing his world when we worship we get a glimpse of heaven. It's our embodied hope. This rhythm of weekly worship and of annual festivals that God gave to his people was designed to create a sense of sacred time in their lives, in their weekly routine, in their annual routine. It's why we gather together weekly to worship. 
The tabernacle in the center, it also created a sense of sacred space where they could be with God. Not because that patch of dirt was any better than anybody else's patch of dirt, but it was because God's presence was with them there. And it's not as though God is only in the tent. After all, he's the world maker. His presence is everywhere. So why this tent, the tabernacle? It was a place set apart where God's people could be present to God's presence. They could be present to the presence. That's what's going on. I want you to watch Andrea and Ali's story and see if you can discover how they sensed God's presence. You will never stop fighting for me When I can fight for myself Every word is a promise you keep Cause you love me like nobody else I grew up in Venezuela and I live here with my parents and my two sisters. I went through a really hard time when I was about 13 years old. I had this really good friend. She's always been there just telling me, God's always with you, he talks to you. You can talk to him and he will talk back. I grew up knowing that God was there, but I didn't know that you can talk to him. So I just decided to put on a test and I was just go to my room, pray, and suddenly the presence of God will just be on my room. It went from a moment of despair, really hurt in my heart to peace and love. And I never felt that before. And then that love that he had for me started to translate into the love for my family. It went from I don't like my family, I hate my family, to I love them, let me hug you because I need to hug you right now. I saw the change and I just could see how she was such a happier person and she loved me so much now. So I remember when I was probably in grade 10, my friend comes to me and she says, do you want to give your life to God? And I'm like, I don't know what that is, but sure. And she starts praying with me. Something like, I just want to give you my life and my spirit is now yours and I will live for you the rest of my life. So since that moment, I really felt different. God became my best friend. He became my prince. He became everything that I was looking for. And then that emptiness that I had in my heart, it just went away. I just had a constant need of seeking him. And it took me a while to understand what was going on. I always felt she loved me, but it was like a different kind of love. Like, it was like Jesus loving me through her. And I just, I love that. I just, I wanted that. So I started talking to Jesus myself, and, and I felt it. And that day I was just like, yeah, you're the one, you're the one. One day I'm gonna be in heaven and I'm gonna be singing to him in front of him. Meanwhile, that happens, I'm gonna worship him right here. I just wanna thank you, Father, for everything you've done in me, in my life, because you planned it from the beginning through Ali's friend, through Ali, through me, and you're working in my family. And I can just see the day when we'll just praise you forever. And I can't wait for it. I'm longing for the day that I'll see you face to face. In the midst of our chaotic and busy lives, we find that we have a place to be present to the presence of God. Archbishop Rowan Williams once said this, made me smile. He says, there's something about sunbathing that tells you what prayer is like far more than religious words. You don't get a better tan by screwing up your eyes and concentrating. You get it by laying still in the sun. <laughs> You see, the greatest danger for God's people in the desert, it wasn't some sort of poisonous snake might bite them or dehydration as they wandered around in the heat. It's that they would forget. They'd forget God. They'd forget how he rescued them, how he set them free. They'd forget how he provided for them. They'd forget how he led them through the desert. They'd forget God and his unending love for them. They'd forget his promises. And you know what? It happened. It happened to them and it happens to us. We call it idolatry worshiping something or someone other than God. 
It was a problem for the people that were Moses was leading in the desert. It's actually a problem for us today. Idolatry is misdirected worship. It's a matter of the heart. You know, in the Old Testament, heart isn't used the way we use the word. We talk about emotions with it. They didn't use the word heart for emotions. In fact, they kind of thought emotions lived in your intestines. You know, I love you all with my entire large colon. (laughs) It's not really a great selling feature, is it? They thought emotions were in your bowels. Heart for them was something else. It was about affection, yes, but it was mostly about attention and decisions, the things that you're committed to. Your heart could love or it could fear. Your heart could turn towards God or turn away from God. There could be hope or despair. It could be our intentions or our feelings. It steers our life. Which way is your heart taking you? God's answer to this challenge of wandering hearts, it wasn't more rules. It was more worship. Because in worship, they could remember who God was and who they are. It was in worship that God could win and shape their hearts. It's in worship that God changes us and forms us. As we become present to the presence of God, he aligns our hearts with his heart. And our behavior, our lives change because we're drawn towards God. I want you to listen to this beautiful invitation to worship in the book of Psalms, if you want to follow with me, in Psalm 95. The author writes this, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and install him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice. What's going on when we worship? You maybe could notice it if you're looking at the words. The beginning, the first couple of verses, he tells us that in worship, we use our mind and we use our heart, we use our body, we use our voice, and we do it joyfully, we use our emotions. One or two of us actually need to let our face know that there's some joy in our heart, I'm just saying. We learn and worship to submit ourselves to God's will and his plan. We listen for his voice so we know what he's saying to us. You know what it means really? It means if we have lots of emotions but we're never really submitting to God and our lives are never changing, we're just having a grand old time but we're not getting anywhere. It's just feelings. And if we're believing in our head all sorts of things about God but we never have any joy in our heart that's visibly and audibly expressed to others, we're not really in God's presence. God's calling us to come as whole people to worship. And what would cause this joy? What would trigger this spontaneous outburst? What would make us choose to submit our lives to God? Where do we place our faith? Look at verse 7. And he says, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if only you'd hear his voice. The author is remembering these great stories of God, God God-sized stories, how he delivered them from slavery in Egypt, how he brought them through the wilderness and took care of them, how he gave to them the promised land and protected them, how he was the shepherd who went with them, even to the hard and difficult places. He's engaging everything about them in worship. If you ever had that sense of you couldn't help yourself worshiping because of a God-sized story, I remember when we first moved to Calgary, 2002. We moved here from Switzerland with three little kids, and they were all bilingual. And my concern for them was, would they be able to keep their German language going? I didn't think their mom and I would be enough to sustain it, living in a new city that's predominantly English. It kind of concerned me because I wondered what their lives would unfold like. When I went to enroll kids in school and went down to the Harry Hayes building to sort things out, I discovered that CBE had been planning a German bilingual school in Calgary. It was the school that was closest to our home, and it was starting that fall. Long before I had anything ever to worry about, God's already taken care of it. The thing that was uppermost in my mind, he's like, dude, I planned this a long time ago. 
Spontaneous worship. I look back at my own story, get more recent, three years ago. Many of you know I had a medical emergency. Spent a week in ICU, and when I'm in there with a cardiologist who couldn't figure out what was wrong with me, they were trying to fish around. There was a conference going on in Calgary at the time of electrophysicians, the world leading expert, and the problem they thought I had was there, and he happened to have a free afternoon so he could come and visit me. Because God's die stories show up in our lives, and they lead us to worship. Where's your God story? You see, worship is ascribing ultimate value to something or someone. The first of the Ten Commandments God gave was don't go worshiping other gods. Worship him and nothing else. Because here's the reality, we're all worshiping. We're all worshiping something or someone. There's no possibility of you not being a worshiper today. Whether you know it or not, you are a worshiper. All of us build our lives on something, give our hearts and our hopes to something. We all worship. We all have to live for something. It could be your career. It could be your family. It could be your lover. It could be your looks. It could be your professional status or accomplishments. But we look to things to give our lives meaning and purpose, things that tell me I'm worth something. And Psalm 95 is reminding us, if you want to know what you're worth, if you want something to be different in your life, then the invitation is to hold on to the heart seeker. Give him your heart. Give him your worship. How do we do it? It tells us right there. It's something we do together. Look at the words in Psalm 95. As our we come, let us sing for joy. Let us shout aloud. Let us bow down in worship. It's something we do together. We are so used to making decisions for ourselves, putting ourselves at the center of the universe, doing what I want, when I want, the way I want it. This kind of seems foreign to us, but it's how worship works. We hear God-sized stories together, and we worship together, and our lives are mostly changed when we are together, when we gather. Have you ever wondered why it's so hard to get to church on time? (laughs) Have you ever wondered why you had an argument in your car with the people you love most on your way here today? Have you ever wondered why your weekend schedule is so busy that it's hard to gather together? Have you ever wondered why your life doesn't change as quickly as you'd like? I'll tell you why. The enemy wants to keep you from corporate weekly worship, that's why. It's exactly why. You'll never really fully know and understand and encounter God till we pray together corporately, till we praise together corporately, till we study God's word together corporately. We do it with others or we will never really know him at all. We get this distorted view unless we're willing to sing together, pray together, rejoice together, praise together, listen together, study together. It's why gathering together in worship is so crucial. Our lives and our behaviors begin to change because we are drawn to the heart seeker in worship. Like a compass needle pointing true north, it begins to happen to us. It's in worship that God shapes us as our hearts begin to align with his. Present to the presence of God here in this space, we become more like Jesus. The formation of our character comes through worship. If you want to become more like Jesus, then make corporate weekly gathering to worship a priority in your life. Because in worship, we become all that God intends for us to be. And it's in worship we begin to do all that God intends for us to do. Not only do we worship together, Psalm 95 mentions some key components. The first five verses are all about praising God and celebrating his presence. And then in the middle, in six and seven, there's this sense of joyful submission to God. And finally, the last part, it goes on talking about God's word. Praise, submission, God's word. It's what we do when we gather too. We praise God and we recognize his greatness, that this God of the universe would love me. It makes me aware of how small I really am and how much I need him. It's why I want to listen to his voice. It's why I want to respond with a glad yes. It's how it happens. We praise God. We recognize that we need him and we choose to listen to him. It matters that we participate. My preaching will never change your life. It's worship that will. It's why I'm encouraging you today to prioritize weekly worship, to be on time, to stay till the end, to participate fully, to be present to the presence of God. Is that easy? No. Is it vital? Absolutely. To worship God is to give him your heart. And let me be really plain, if you don't give him your heart, you'll give it to something else. 
There's no question of our not worshiping. The only question is who or what will we worship? God desires your heart because he's your creator. He's the world maker. He has great plans for you. He is the dream giver. Jesus has come to set you free. He's the chain breaker. Can you see why he's the heart seeker? You know, when we read the New Testament, the stories of Jesus, this language of this portable worship center, the tent, the tabernacle, it shows up. Listen to this in John's account of the life of Jesus, John 1 verse 14. It says this, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory is of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Some translations like the one I read say made his dwelling. Some will say he moved into the neighborhood. But the word that they're translating there literally means tabernacled, the tent. It is in Jesus that we encounter God's presence. He is God's presence with us. It's in Jesus that we can be present to the presence of God with us. It's in Jesus that we are invited to worship. So how will you surrender your heart, your affections, your decisions to Jesus because he's the heart seeker. Maybe you've never encountered Jesus before. This is all new to you. Why don't you have a quiet conversation with him even now? Tell him your story. Tell him the truth about you. You won't offend him. Let him know what you'd like to be different. Let him know that you'd like to encounter him today. Begin that journey with him. It's the best decision you could ever make. Maybe for some of us, the question is, what actually causes my heart to surrender to God? What things help me listen better for his voice? What helps me be aware of his presence? What helps me align my life with God's purposes? It's easy to be cynical in worship. I didn't like those songs this week. It's too loud, it's too quiet, it's too fast, it's too slow. The preacher's too funny, he's too dry. I'm the preacher, I even feel that way. <laughs> Here's the thing. I have refused to allow myself to sit on the sidelines criticizing and complaining. I'm not the coach. I'm not the critic or the cynic. I'm here to be present to the presence of God, not because he needs my praise, but because I desperately need his presence. Amen. Do you need Jesus today? I know sometimes you end up thinking, well, if you only knew, if God only knew, if he only knew what I've done, if he only knew what I was thinking about this morning, he wouldn't want me. He'd toss me into the long grass. Nobody would want me. But Jesus is here already waiting for you. He tabernacles with us. You're not a disappointing child to God who had high hopes for you and somehow you've let him down. That's not true. You're not a problem for God where your life's gone sideways and he thinks, I have so much work to fix you. That's not true. He is wildly in love with you. He loves you regardless of what you think about him. You're, he is loving you right now. He can't wait to be with you. Can you imagine that God catches his breath when he sees you coming to worship? Can you imagine that his palms are all sweaty thinking you've come to be present to his presence? Can you imagine that his heart skipped a beat because you showed up here today? Can you imagine it? Like a husband with his bride? Like a mother with her newborn child? There's nothing can keep you from God's embrace. We don't need to wing God's love. We celebrate it as we worship. Are you ready to hold on to the heart seeker? Today could be the moment for you to do it literally right now and just say, Jesus, I need you. I want you. Come right now. Maybe today, as Kyle mentioned, could be the day for you to be baptized, to publicly declare your faith, to make that decision loud and proud that you are following Jesus, that you would begin a magnificent adventure with him. We've got everything ready for you, shirts and towels and all sorts of things because we want to baptize you today. We will celebrate and worship with people going in the water, exploding out of the water with praise, and their lives will never be the same. The Apostle Paul once wrote to his friends in Rome. He said this, Don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that this, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may live a new life. He's saying when you begin placing your trust in Jesus, when you begin following him, when you're baptized, it's like you died and you're united with Jesus in his death. There's something mysterious going on in this symbol. And it's not just going under the water he talks about. He says going under the water symbolizes burial. I've conducted hundreds of funerals. And I think almost the hardest point consistently is when a casket is lowered into the ground. People start breaking down and crying all over again. It's the finality of it all. 
And that's exactly what God is saying to us here. You died with Jesus, and when you go under, it's final. In baptism, we fully and finally identify with Jesus. And why does it matter? Because when we come up out of that water, we share in his resurrected life. We share in his new life, a life that is reinforced and energized by the Holy Spirit, a life that no one can ever take from you or be ripped away from you. We are united with Jesus in this brand new life. A new way of living happens right here, right today. A life of mercy and grace because of Jesus. St. Augustine, you may have heard his name. He, he lived in North Africa. He was a pastor there. Before he became a follower of Jesus, he had problems with sexual self-control. One day after he surrendered his life to Jesus, he's walking along a street and he bumps into one of his own girlfriends and she says hi to him. She comes up to him and tries to invite him to come back to her place. He actually writes all this stuff in his autobiography. I'm not making it up. She invites him up and he says, Sir, thanks very much, but no thanks, not today. She walks away and thought, maybe he didn't recognize me. And she turns back to him and says, Augustine, it's I. And he said, I know, but it's no longer I. You see what he's saying? I used to be the person that always had to have the girl. I used to be the person who had all these relationships, no matter how destructive they were. They weren't about love. They were just about filling a hole in my heart. I needed to have this. I needed the person who had to have. I was driven. That's what I worshipped at one point, but not anymore. Because of Jesus, I'm different. I don't need this. I'm free to love. I'm free not to hurt anybody anymore. I don't need the things I once did. That's a God-sized story. You could fill in the blank. I used to be. I used to be the person who had to have a relationship. I used to be the person who had to be ego propped up. I used to be the person who could never make it work without somebody there beside me. I used to be the person who what? but not anymore. I'm somebody else in Jesus. It's why we have everything ready for you to be baptized right now. They're going to open the door over here on my left. You're right, the light will be on. If you've not even thought about baptism till this moment in time, I'd love to baptize you today. Everything's ready. Shirts, shorts, towels, hair dryers, because the heart seeker is ready to welcome you home. He's waiting for you. And we are going to sing the way Psalm 95 said. We're going to sing, we're going to shout, we're going to clap, we're going to celebrate. We're going to make sure everybody knows how much Jesus loves us. We are going to worship and you are going to witness a bunch of God-sized stories today as we do. Lives that have been changed. So what's holding you back? The heart seeker is here waiting for you. So Father, we pray. We pray right now that you would meet with us, those of us that have never said yes to Jesus, and we're wondering, but today we're saying, Jesus, I need you, I want you. Change my life, take me, make me, do something for me today, I pray. And for some of us, we've struggled with worship, and our hearts get a little stiff and sore sometimes. And we're praying, Lord, would you soften us up? Would you woo us and win us with your presence today, that we could be fully present to the presence of God in our worship? And for those that are being baptized and those that are sitting on the edge of their chair thinking, will I, won't I right now? Father, I pray that as they get baptized and make this monumentous decision, that they would hear your voice saying, you are my child and I am so pleased with you. So help us today to say yes to you, the heart seeker. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.